Tell us about Paul's Promise. It really is an incredible true story that my company had the opportunity to produce last year. And um, uh, the, the, it's, a, it's a true story, as I mentioned, that, that took place in the, uh, still taking place as we speak. There's a, um, a church in North Little Rock, Arkansas called Friendly Chapel. And uh, it was started by a man who, by his own admission, was bigoted, racist. Uh, in the, um, the mid-1960s, he was a firefighter for the North Little Rock um, Fire Department. And his mother uh, prayed for him fervently. And she, from the time he was a, a tiny little boy, she was, would take the, the whole family to church and would pray for him and would constantly say, Paul, you need, to, you need to give your life to Jesus. He's got big plans for you. And Paul, would, you know, it just sort of water off a duck's back, as we say in the South. It just didn't stick for whatever reason. His best friend when he was little, was, and he was a, a son of a sharecropper, Paul was, and his best friend was black. And he had a great rapport with his best friend. And as both boys grew older, they, they went their separate ways. And, and again, by Paul's own admission, he just, he was wrapped up in, a, in a, a racist culture in the South, wherein, you know, the height of the civil rights movement in the 60s, particularly in the South, black folks and white folks rarely were seen together. And oftentimes it was contentious uh, when they were. And uh, on his mother's deathbed, and it's what you see in the movie, is, is kind of his life leading up to, to Paul's own conversion. But on his mother's deathbed, basically, he promised her that he would look into this Jesus thing. Like he, he made a promise that he fulfilled to his mom and said, you know, okay, for you, I will, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And in true Jesus fashion, there was a radical transformation. I mean, from, and it's based on a book, and in his own book he talks about uh, one day he was drunk, and the next day he never touched another drop of alcohol. He never touched another cigarette or cigar, and he, it was a complete 180. For most of us, there's some semblance of a, of a gradual transformation right. as we try to figure out this new life. But for Paul Holderfield, it was a 180. And um, among the things that he knew that he needed to, to make amends for in his life as a new follower of Jesus was to find his childhood best friend whom he had denied. Again, not unlike the, the, the Peter and Jesus story, um, there was a moment, we, we took a little creative license in the film when you see it, and we, we put it in a different setting. The true story is um, during the, uh, the Little Rock Nine, what they often call the, the, the Little Rock incident or the Little Rock Nine during the, the desegregation of schools in Little Rock, um, Paul and his firefighter friends were attending um, a rally, attending the protest, and his childhood friend, his black friend who he had not seen in years, walked up to him and he was so excited to see Paul, his friend, at this, this rally, this protest, that he stuck his hand out to shake his hand and give him a big hug, and Paul stuck his hands in his back pocket and turned away and denied his best friend. And he said, that night I went home and cried myself to sleep. And I promised myself and the Lord and my wife that I would never let that happen again. When the Lord got hold of his life, he went back to the inner city of, of North Little Rock and started feeding people, started feeding kids and, and essentially just loving on people. He, he knew that there was a need there and he sort of by accident started a, started a de facto soup kitchen where he just wanted to do whatever he could. His, his friends and, his, and many of his contemporaries said, don't, don't go to that part of town. Surely you, I mean, you'll, you'll end up dead if you do. And he uh, defied the, the, you know, the recommendations and went down and, and started talking to people and loving on people and feeding people. And that evolved into a ministry, which evolved into a church. And he was the first to say, I'm not a, I'm not a pastor. I've never been to seminary. His, his wife would often say, you've never even read a book, much, le book, much less write one, you know. So he started Friendly Chapel and he welcomed everybody. And it was very, as you know, very avant-garde in the late 1960s, especially in a, in a southern city to say everybody is welcome in this right. church and everybody is welcome on the platform. And if you love Jesus, you can preach from this platform. And so he reconnected with his childhood best friend and that church, Dean, still exists today. 50 plus years later, every member of his family are vocational pastors in, in some way in the church. His son, Paul Holderfield Jr. is the senior pastor of that church. He has a, another oh, son yeah. who, is a, who is a worship leader and another son who's, in, um, uh, who's a youth leader there. And, that, and they have served millions and millions of meals uh, since the 1960s and it, the doors are wide open still today. Unbelievable. Yeah. Isn't it powerful what, the, what one person, right. the Lord, in your words, the Lord getting a hold of somebody. Yeah. 
what can happen. It really did. I mean, that's a great story. Paul's Promise, check it out. Um, and uh, I'm gonna check it out, that sounds fantastic. Thank you. Ryan, thanks for what you're doing and who you are, and it's great to meet you. Truly my pleasure, thank you so much. Thanks for coming. We'll see you next time.